In this second part, I want to walk you through the actual manufacturing, discovery of the vaccine, and the different phases of research that uh, have to be completed before a vaccine can be approved for use in humans. So let's go to the slides. And um, in pharmaceutical development, there are two main groups of molecules or substances that, that get studied and eventually approved for use in human beings. Small molecules, which are the, the pills or the, the elixirs um, or antibiotics, for example, those are called small molecules. And um, they basically go through the same phases that a vaccine goes, except that a vaccine is not a small molecule because it's a large protein. So vaccines, uh, hormones, for example, uh, monoclonal antibodies, they are all uh, part of a group called biologicals. And most of them have this very heavy core of protein, but the phases of development are actually pretty similar. Okay, now there are four phases of development that I'm gonna to explain to you from one to four. And then there is this ongoing uh, period of pharmacovigilance that continues throughout the lifetime of uh, any approved subject. Um, and in the case of vaccines specifically, we have very tight and um, strict manufacturing norms. And then of course there are rules for quality control for stability, the very narrow ranges of temperature where the product has to be kept so that it, you know, we can assure its conservation. And then of course, there's the approval and licensing by regulatory authorities um, proper to each country. Of course, in the US is the FDA, which is pretty much the standalone regulatory body in the United States, but in other countries, uh, for example, in Europe, there is a procedure that is called a centralized procedure where you can get a product approved in one country and then it kind of follows, the, there's a simpler uh, pr um, process in the other countries to then proceed with that approval. It's not automatic, but it's, uh, it's a practical way to sort of share in the, um, in the uh, revision of the scientific data. Now, the very first part of the vaccine journey is really trying to identify what is it that we want to fight. So we saw it could be a bacteria, it could be a virus, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, pretty quickly after the pandemic started, actually by May, the centers of disease control had already identified the virus and you identify the virus the same way that you identify um, a person, a name, a profile, uh, a way of working, a modus operandi, an MO, um, and you can then classify it. And because this is all genetic material, now this genetic material, like I said, needs a host cell. It's as having a computer program that cannot work without a computer, or like having an app without the smartphone. So the virus behaves as a computer program or as an app in search of a, a device. So pretty early, the CDC um, identified it and started the process of viral culturing. So what they do is they pretty much plant it, like a plant, in cells. And there are different kind of cellular cultures. Um, in the past, uh, for example, with influenza virus, they were using chicken eggs, believe it or not. Tons of chicken eggs put it into a panel and put into a machine that, that conserves them in a certain temperature called a bioreactor, which I will show you. Um, but anyhow, this started pretty early and this is the discovery time when we're trying to figure out what is it that we want to, to control. Now, of course, um, we have started the clinical phases and, and as I promised, I will go through the different phases, but Right now, as of uh, yesterday, we had 135 vaccines trying to do this initial matching of the vaccine type with the virus. 
and uh, we have 19 in phase one, 12 in phase two, eight on phase three. And these approvals are actually, by the way, this preliminary, uh, very um, mysterious approvals in our country. China has a vaccine that is being given to military personnel, and Russia has a vaccine that is not even uh, finished the phase three, and they have approved it internally. So it's good to understand that. But the phase that is important to keep in mind is phase three, and I'm going to explain to you the differences. So the way to, to understand the, the development phases is to picture a, a ladder with five steps, all right? The preclinical, the first step is the one where you're doing all this discovery, and also when you're gonna try the vaccines first in animals. That's a very important step, because those studies in animals are gonna allow the FDA in the US and other regulatory authorities in the rest of the world to give permission to proceed with what's called the first time in human studies. And when we start from phase one onwards, that's the clinical phase of development. Phase one is a relatively small study, dozens of patients, usually not more than 100 people. And basically, it's gonna show you whether there are immediate adverse reactions and whether there is immune reactivity. Remember those little cartoons that I showed you, those, those uh, cells and, and the antibodies that get produced very, very early looking at whether there is such a reaction. Phase two is now a bigger study uh, that can be up to a thousand people, give or take. And it starts to show you a better profile of immunogenicity. It's gonna show if those antibodies that I showed you in the other uh, photo, uh, if they neutralize the, uh, the virus, and also if there are cells in the immune system that are ready to fight. It's also a better window into the safety and potential um, risks of the vaccine. And very important, it allows to figure out the dose that is gonna be used in the vaccine and whether you need one only or two or three boosters. And that all comes from phase two. And as you saw in the slide, it's a good number that is finishing phase two, but there is only a handful that has entered phase three. Phase three, usually also the green light for the phase three is done in concert with the uh, FDA in the USA. So the companies that are working this phase is keep in close contact, given the interim data to the FDA. And this is where the large scale trials start. And for a vaccine like the COVID vaccine, uh, we are talking around 30,000 people because you need, you need to compare with placebo, ideally. You need a control group. Um, you need to then demonstrate efficacy. Previous, previous phases don't prove efficacy. They just prove that there's an immune reaction. Now we're gonna talk efficacy now we're going to talk about seeing if these people contract or don't contract the virus, and if they do, whether it's a milder disease. And here we're going to have a better sense of the safety of the vaccine, because there are some severe reactions that have been described in other vaccines in the history of medicine that happen very rarely, say one in 10,000 people, to give you an example. So unless you have upwards of 10,000 people, you might not be able to discover those reactions. So this is really the, the uh, deciding step towards either an emergency use authorization by the FDA or towards a final licensure approval of the vaccine. And once it goes to market, and, and the time is very important, um, this is a process that can take at least 10 months in the standard time of review. And if it is an expedited review, like it might happen in a pandemic, it might go down to six months. But it's by no means anything that the FDA is planning to rush through because they need to keep an eye on our safety. And then on phase four, after it is out in the market and after it's being used, that's when we're gonna talk about effectiveness, which is are we gonna achieve that herd immunity or not? And what's gonna happen in the long term with regards to safety? Okay, so then comes 
the period of regulatory revision, which is poorly understood sometimes. Um, this is done in the US, of course, by the FDA, in Europe by the European Medicinal Agency and rest of the world has um, their own regulatory bodies. In the United States, every product that is proposed for um, treating or preventing a disease is also uh, requested to submit what's called a pediatric study plan. Uh, pediatric studies are not allowed until there is approval for adults. So that is also a good thing. And then of course, the question around whether the FDA would call an advisory committee meeting before approving a vaccine. And there have been some, um, some news and some announcement that there may indeed be such an advisory committee which allows the public to participate and also hear about the data around the vaccine. Um, then, of course, these manufacturing norms that I mentioned, stability, temperature, that all has to be met. And that's also um, a step in the whole regulatory approval process. In the US, there are already some buy deals. You, you all know about the warp speed operation. Um, in terms of worldwide distribution, there are several um, philanthropic organizations. Uh, one of the more important ones is Gavi, which is a vaccine alliance that works closely with um, the World Health Organization that also has a program called COVAX, C-O-V-A-X that would allow third world countries to have access to vaccines. And what's very interesting is that even though we hear that so many million doses have been bought, so many um, you know, million dollars have been allocated to a few of the companies that are ahead of the game, it's notable to realize that these companies that are more ahead, you know, like Moderna, like Pfizer, like AstraZeneca, University of Oxford, um, they are producing the vaccine, but they're doing it at risk because until the phase three is not completed, um, they are at risk of losing the product that they've produced uh, ahead of time. Uh, the, the payment or the reservation of a million doses does not guarantee that that vaccine is going to pass through the phase three testing. Uh, and again, that is reassuring from the point of view of our safety. This is a nice uh, cartoon of the uh, journey, the expected journey of the vaccine. This is from the Wall Street Journal. This is a bioreactor. This one is used for those vaccines that work with uh, attenuated or inactivated viruses. So here is where the, the um, trays with um, cell cultures get conserved and maintained. And once the virus is, is planted, remember this is, this is like planting a seed, it starts to replicate quickly. And then th this is why you can have millions and millions of doses done, you know, at the same time. After that, of course, then comes the work of extracting the product, putting it in, into a formulation that will later be either injected or in the case of oral vaccines, you know, ingested. And in other cases, there aren't even uh, inhaled vaccines that are being studied. And then comes the transportation. Usually these are special airliners uh, that um, have the, the temperature and the pressure and all the environmental um, needs to make sure that the vaccine makes it in one piece to whatever the city is where it's going. And then of course there will be um, special trucks that would also have the, the exact uh, temperature conditions to then distribute it in smaller units to the hospitals or the clinics and to the doctors who eventually will get it to us. So I think that here you have a picture of this whole very complex, very long, very involved uh, process of vaccine production. Now, before before I, I finish, I want to mention some FDA stipulations for research. And this is available under on 
their web page. There is a document, a guidance for industry, with all the very specific tenets, stipulations, rules of the game for the development and licensure of vaccines. And it's a very interesting document. Um, it is very pointed in highlighting the need to have a very close safety surveillance especially for these very rare events. Specifically, there is a condition known as enhanced respiratory disorder, which was seen with some of the early, or early uh, vaccinations for respiratory syncytial viruses in children, babies actually. And therefore, um, this kind of reaction, which are antibody dependent, and there are other examples with other vaccines, uh, can be very serious. The FDA has a dedicated page in the guidance as to what they expect in terms of monitoring for, uh, for this kind of uh, adverse events. And then of course, we'll be, um, we'll be waiting to find out if and when um, there may be an advisory committee for COVID-19. Um, High FDA officials have already um, implied that there, there may very well be such an advisory committee meeting, which is a public meeting. Um, it will be obviously available online this time, but in the old days, you could actually go physically, sign up and go and, and be there. And they are very exciting meetings, but they are extremely, extremely time consuming for the uh, vaccine manufacturers. The preparation goes on for months. In fact, my guess is that they're already preparing for such a potential advisory committee. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I had in my career uh, in pharmaceutical uh, research, I, I had the opportunity to participate in quite a few. And it, again, it's a very intense experience, but um, it is a really a reassurance that um, the FDA is looking out for, for our safety. So putting together the whole story that I gave you today, um, there's no doubt that the FDA is the final common pathway. Um, in the US, we are obviously blessed to have funds that can go and reserve vaccine doses ahead of time. Uh, we have some very motivated vaccine sponsors, but let's not forget the public. And this is where the FDA and a potential outcome uh, really underscore the importance of security, education, and also our, um, our participation in the decision for, for uh, a final vaccine recommendation. And I'm gonna stop here and open this up for questions. And I thank you very much for listening to my presentation.